All right, entomology class, how are you doing today? We're going to have a, uh, hopefully some fun with this uh, lesson today. We're going to talk about the orders of whole metabola. I'm going to give you a warning. I'm going to try and show you some cool stuff. However, I am not an amazing audio-visual uh, expert, so it's going to be a little rough. But that's okay. The information is what matters, and the coolness is what matters. So we're going to talk about the holometabola, right? This is our, our focus today. If you remember, it was right here where insects evolved wings, right here where insects evolved the new wings that fold. Right here is where they evolved complete metamorphosis. This is where the holometabola begins. If we look at it on this uh, figure over here, this is, this is a holometabola. That looks like a four. All right, that's where uh, this group evolved. We can kind of look at it, uh, the whole thing right here. It's a monophyletic group. Uh, it's really important. Uh, and so it's very cool in that regard. Um, if we look at, so I got to look where my face is not. Um, Neoptera would be right here on this tree. All the things that have the new form of wings. Okay. So we can blow this up. We're going to first focus on Hymenoptera. Hymenoptera is sister taxa to all the rest. So this is another monophyletic clade starting right here, right? And Hymenoptera is just outside everything else. And that's kind of where we're going to start with the bees, the wasps, and the ants. Don't worry about Mer uh, Mercopterida or Neuropteroida. Uh, we don't worry about those. We're just going to worry about these orders. Uh, I really guess I should get the marker. Like Hymenoptera, Megaloptera, Ophidioptera, Neuroptera, Strepsiptera, Coleoptera, Lepidoptera, Trichoptera, Diptera, Mecoptera, and Siphonoptera. For today's video, we're going to do the bottom half of that, Hymenoptera up to Coleoptera, and then we'll uh, have a second video for the next little bit. So, uh, I want to show you kind of a couple of cool Hymenopterans to start things off, just because uh, they are cool. So, here is... A, an ichneumon wasp, all right? This is, uh, it looks like it has a long, three long stingers. Those are actually it's ovipositors, ovipositors, which means they're where they uh, deposit their eggs. I'll tell you a little bit more about these in a minute, but you can see how big that thing is. I mean, here's my hand next to it. Uh, it's a pretty big insect, really long. You can catch these around here. Very cool uh, organisms. Here's another one you can't catch around here, but is also very, very cool. This is a kind of a spider wasp, a Pompilidae. That thing can sting, and it hurts unbelievably badly. I haven't had the pleasure, but I had some friends who have. Uh, the sting of that thing can paralyze a tarantula in seconds. Um, it's very, very potent. Very good uh, sting that's got going on there. All right. So, <clears throat> the hymenoptera, hymen means a membrane, and terra, of course, means wings. Uh, so these are the membranous wings. As you can see from this, uh, up here we have a tephridid, a sawfly. See how membranous those wings are? Some individuals also say they have the, the married wings, uh, and I'll talk about what that means on the next slide. But you got your uh, big hornets and some wasps, bees, ants, sawflies. A lot of really cool insects going on there. So the hymenoptera have these hamulae. They're little tiny hooks along their hind wing right here. The hook onto their forewing. So they make their wings joined together, and that's where they get this name, married wings. Um, and if you remember from our video on um, when we talked about the... Uh, wings and the external anatomy of the insects. Uh, we get the video of the Hymenoptera, the bee flying and, and the pattern of the wings flying. And the hind wing and forewing are connected. So it kind of makes like a larger wing. They're incredibly good flyers and it's really beneficial for that. Uh, they're very diverse. We have about 120,000 described species, although there's likely probably upwards of a million species of hymenoptera. I'll talk about why that is. They have hymenoptera eat just about everything. They're herbivores, predators, parasites of other insects. 
Um, some eat uh, meat <laughs> if they can get it. Uh, I'll talk about that as well. Uh, some are you social. Uh, you haven't talked about, uh, or you haven't probably gone to the sociality in insects yet. Um, what it means to be truly social. I'll talk. I'll tease that here. Well, you hopefully you looked at the termites and we talked about it there as well. We'll tease it here, but then we'll um, get into it a little bit later. Uh, the honeybees and some other things are amazing pollinators. We also have a lecture on pollination coming up, but. There's about 20,000 species of bees, and a lot of them are really important pollinators. And some have uh, a scope or a cubicula on the bottom where they uh, collect pollen on their abdomen. Others collect it on their legs uh, and the pollen baskets that you see uh, on um, big bumblebees and honeybees, especially. They get a lot of pollen uh, and them that way. So the social bees uh, are, well, they're, they're truly social or use social insects, and they're really important, uh, very, very cool insects. They have the, the telltale signs of sociality. They have a reproductive cast. They have overlapping generations uh, in the same nest always. Uh, they have a division of labor uh, between queens and workers, and sometimes the workers even divide up more to protectors and those that go get the pollen and those that, that take care of the little uh, larvae as they're coming up. Uh, very, very cool. Uh, if we look at the different the different casts here, we have the queen, right? Uh, she lays all the eggs. And it's important to note, we're not going to get so much into the genetics of these things right now, but for the bees, the fertilized eggs develop into females, unfertilized eggs develop into males. So usually you have a drone, the drone is just a reproductive, doesn't do anything else. Kind of a worthless thing in the, uh, in the bee colony, to be honest. Um, if she runs out of eggs, she can lay an unfertilized egg, have a drone, and then mate with that male to have more workers. Uh, I know it sounds kind of bizarre and messy, but uh, that's just the way things are. Um, and I'll link this YouTube video to kind of kind of check that out. Um, all right, the social bees. Uh, there's the social bees are really cool. There's also some solitary bees. When we think of bees, we think oh honeybees. Maybe we think of bumblebees, but in fact, there's thousands and thousands of other bees that are solitary bees, uh, just kind of doing their thing. Uh, an example of these are cuckoo bees. Cuckoo bees can be metallic, or can they be like this bee you can see here? Uh, I should say, like, nope, right, right there. Uh, <laughs> these bees are nest parasites, so we call them kleptoparasitic. They don't build their own nest; they steal uh, nests from others. Uh, so they lay their eggs in cells provisioned by the host bee. Uh, the cuckoo larvae will hatch out; it will consume the host larva ball, uh, larvae's pollen ball, and uh, she'll go ahead and the, the little babies will kill the other uh, larvae in the, that are in the nest and eat them if it can. Um, kind of bizarre. Uh, but something that takes place actually a lot more in the animal kingdom than we like to probably think about. All right, bees and wasps, what's the difference? Uh, generally speaking, Well, to be honest, wasp isn't a great term. Bee's not a great term. There, there's a lot of diversity, a lot of different groups in these things. They call bees and wasps. But in a generalized sense, bees are fuzzy, thick uh, legs, broad waist, uh, kind of cool in that regard. Wasps are skinny body, skinny legs, thin waist. Uh, especially this one, you can see this is called a thread-waisted wasp. Uh, uh, mud dauber is this one. It's really really cool wasp. You can actually find these around here some different species in this group um, They're very cool. I really like wasps. I've always loved to collect wasps. Here's another one. That's a thread waisted wasp um, and this is a Vespid a hornet uh, Again people are always like oh, what's a wasp? What's a hornet? What's a yellow jacket? Those are common names and they're not terribly good You know family names are really helpful. This is Vespidae. This is Fessidae uh, that's really a better way to think about 
that way you're using actual groups but a lot of people call these hornets or yellow jackets um, I pretty much call them bees or wasps you take your pick these can be social or solitary uh, predators or parasitoids and we'll talk about what a parasitoid is in a couple of slides here um, they're often yellow and black and that's kind of a warning sign for most animals a, a broad yellow and black coloration says hey don't mess with me I will sting you and it will hurt really really bad right so they they don't mess around the wasps uh, as part of the wasps you could say <clears throat> are the yellow jackets again not great terms also people call these things hornets I prefer I like the, the white faced hornets they're a lot like the yellow jackets uh, they're a little bigger and meaner but these things are just terrible they uh, these are native to the United States this is the eastern yellow jacket they prey on insects uh, flies and caterpillars they'll actually I remember as a kid uh, doing some fishing up in Alaska they were cutting up all this salmon and these things would come down and they were just swarming around the salmon they would come down chew off chunks of it and fly away with it uh, pretty pretty mean suckers um, I've even had them show up at picnics here in Pennsylvania uh, they can repeat sting which is not very pleasant uh, they get really mad they'll just keep stinging you now this is one that everybody's curious about uh, the giant Asian hornets the giant Asian hornets are really nasty really dangerous massively huge uh, you're talking a couple inches which for a hornet is really big and really mean and they're fairly dangerous they are not here as of right now recording this uh, there is not giant Asian hornets in this part of the world they've made it into um, Washington a little bit into Vancouver uh, but we don't find them here in Pennsylvania uh, or Ohio New York or anywhere kind of near here so that's good uh, they are very dangerous an older person or a very young person if they got stung multiple times by these things or somebody who's allergic could have a terrible reaction and um, could possibly pass away um, so they're, they're bad they're not you know bad as a snake bite probably but they're they can be bad especially if they swarm what we do have here is a European hornet the European hornet is another invasive that's made it here um, and they are also pretty bad they're not as big as the giant Asian hornet all right so uh, people probably at least two three times a year I get someone bringing in a European hornet like hey dr. Ruel is this a giant Asian hornet I'm like no thank goodness it's not it's just a European hornet now there's a spider wasp these are the ones I talked about earlier we call them tarantula hawks when they take down a tarantula uh, mine has black wings although I have quite a few with orange wings as well um, you can see here this cool critter uh, this is one of the biggest ones I've ever seen the one that I have here um, actually is probably the biggest one I've ever seen it's from Mexico they are uh, so what they do is they they catch a spider they sting it uh, the sting will paralyze the spider and then they'll bury the spider in the ground and lay eggs on it so the spiders alive spiders are predator doesn't have to eat all that often it has big meals and then can last for quite a while without a meal and that's perfect for the tarantula hawk because then the little babies can eat a live meal it's kind of gross but they um, they just kind of lay an egg on it and that little baby eats it as it grows it is kind of gross um, but pretty cool uh, parasitoids I talked about these as well this is why there's probably close to a million species we have 120,000 species described there's probably a million because some hypothesize that almost every species of insect might have its own specialized parasitoid wasp that will attack it so we have ectoparasitoids uh, this is kind of a picture of that these are um, a bunch of parasitoids on this caterpillar endoparasitoids is a really gross thing down here is a caterpillar full of internal parasitoids <clears throat> they develop inside the host and they eat it out while they're developing and then hatch out um, they're kind of nasty 
little critters, but but pretty cool as well. Uh, the Ick Newman that I showed at the beginning, I guess I should probably pull that up again, right? Our Ick Newman wasp. It's like this one here on the left. Is the Braconid. Um, that's a the Braconids and Ick Newmans are sister taxa to each other. They're very similar. They will fly around and they will find a. Um, they listen on a tree and then they find a beetle that's eating, that's a larvae inside the tree. Then they burrow inside there with their ovipositor and lay an egg on it. And then that egg will eat the larvae of the beetle as it grows. Um, again, kind of gross, but really cool uh, that it has that capability. This other one here is just a small little uh, parasitoid. A lot of them are very, very small and really cool. And most of them aren't as big as those giant ichneumons. Okay, the last kind of big group uh, to talk about <clears throat> within the hymenoptera are the ants. Ants are very, very cool. They're easily distinguished from termites by having a very thin body, constricted body, and these elbowed antennae, right? Th uh, termites have a, a very uh, a longer um, antennae. There's, there's no bend in it, all right? They are also so truly social. They are... Termites take up about 10% of the living biomass, animal biomass of the planet. They say ants are the next 10%. So termites and ants accumulate or compensate for 20% of the living animal biomass on the planet. When you think about how many termites it takes to make an elephant, there's a lot of termites and ants, right? Um, but they have the caste system. Um, actually, I'll go to the next one. So... We have uh, the minor, the major, and the super major, the queens. The queens, of course, are reproductive. Males are only there to be reproductive. And then you have workers. And workers differentiate between, like, these big super majors with a massive head. Uh, and they kind of become um, the soldiers, the protectors. And then the other ones become minors. And there's some we don't really understand terribly well what differentiates them because they can be genetically almost identical to each other they're all coming out of the same queen but there's some interesting genetics that gets turned on and turned off switches that get flipped uh, to make these really big heads and really mean uh, fighters all right ants are also associated often with aphids there's actually lots of ants that do different types of, of farming um, when we talk social insects, you'll see about the ants that uh, farm fungus, right? That's very, very cool. They also kind of herd and farm aphids. They get the honeydew. Aphids will stick their stylets into the plant. They get way too much phloem going through them. And so they have to excrete it out their back end, out of their conicles. And ants are just sitting there just waiting to lap it right up. They love it. Uh, they love every, every wonderful drop. Um, army ants, these things are just awesome and horrible all at the same time. Uh, when I lived in Thailand, Southeast Asia, they're all over the place. you got to really be careful um, because if you disrupt a tree that they're on, they'll just start dropping on you and they can sting and bite and it's very annoying. A couple of them. A lot of them gets very, very bad. Um, but they will go, they'll raid and consume vegetation and small animals in their path, which is pretty insane uh one time when i was living out there in thailand we killed a small poisonous snake near one of the houses and within about 10 minutes it had just a swarm of ants on it and within a couple hours the snake was just gone they just picked it apart and dragged it away um they make their nests in these bivouacs they kind of glue a bunch of leaves together and just kind of mass in there and then get all the uh all the eggs in there and um, this is our lecture on edible insects, but um, in Thailand they love to eat the eggs of these things. So they actually collect the nests and put them in a bucket and try and kill all the uh, adults and eat the eggs. I'm not sure why. But speaking of eating ants, uh, the honeypot ants are also supposed to be pretty tasty for eating. These things will just store up sugar water and become kind of a reservoir to feed the other ants. And they'll just sit there and they'll give droplets to ants as they come by if they need a little, little boost of energy, a little Gatorade, right? Um, and apparently, 
they taste pretty good. Uh, people in lots of other cultures love to pop these in the mouth and chew on them. They taste really sweet. Uh, they're probably people that don't have Skittles readily available, um, which is not a bad thing. It's probably a very good thing for their teeth and for their uh, diabetes. <laughs> So they probably taste really, really delicious to them. Um, and another really cool ant, the bulldog ant from Australia. Uh, very, very mean. Has a nice bite and a sting. Uh, not something you want to mess with. A really big ant. Probably the biggest ant on the planet. Um, I didn't have a picture of this. There's also the thing called the bullet ant down in uh, uh, Peru. A bullet ant is supposed to be unbelievably mean and have the worst sting. Uh, these are fire ants. So we have the wonderful blessing of fire ants in North America. Uh, they're brought in from other places. They can raft when they get flooded out, which is kind of cool and kind of psycho. Uh, and if you ever get messed up with, with, with a, a nest of one of these things, man, their bite, it, they get the name fire ant for a good reason. It feels like your feet or your hands are on fire. Um, it's very unpleasant. I've, I've, I've had the experience and don't want to have it again. <laughs> All right, ants and wasps are great uh, builders. So you've probably seen some of these paper wasp nests uh, hanging in trees and things like that. Not something you want to mess with. Don't throw a rock at it. Don't try and knock it down. <clears throat> They're really mean. A lot of ants, or a lot of, yeah, a lot of ants and a lot of uh, wasps actually build their nests in the ground. Here is a subterranean leafcutter ant colony in Brazil. So they're excavating this whole thing. This video actually shows the excavation of this whole thing. I'll link that uh, in the class notes. All right, that concludes our discussion of Hymenoptera, finally. Uh, we're going to go on to uh, some other orders before we hit the Coleoptera. That's the only one that's going to be another big one today. Um, so the Megaloptera, the alder flies, dobson flies, and fish flies. They're very cool. They have these long, uh, large, uh, membranous wings. They have aquatic larvae, which I'll show on the next one. Um, the males can have these really big mandibles, like these you can see down here. I've got a couple slides. I've got another image of that. Um, they're harmless to humans. They look mean, but they, the, the mandibles are mostly there to just impress females. So this is the larvae. The larvae is called a helgramite. Some people also call them toe biters, although I think of toe biters just as the um, the uh, giant water bugs, which are very, very cool insects. That's what I think of when I think toe biters, but hey, you know, everyone's got their thing. Um, they live under rocks. Uh, they, they are predaceous. Uh, they're nocturnal, uh, and they can be kind of mean uh, living under the water, eating other insects. Uh, Pretty gnarly looking. They can get pretty big. I mean, you can get Helgramite to be that big. Dobson flies can as well. I had a female Dobson fly at my house just two nights ago. Uh, about that big flying around. Pretty cool. If it had been a male, I would have collected it. There's, they have these big, impressive jaws. It's really, really cool. So there's a lot of what we call sexual dimorphism um, between the males and females of these things. Next order is a Neuroptera. These are the nerve wings or net winged insects. They're really, really cool. These you can find at night around here uh, all over the place. Go out in the summertime on a warm night. They'll be hanging out by lights, and they look so cute, these little green things, and they're actually really voracious predators. Um, this is what this thing looks like as an immature. Talk about ugly to kind of cute. Uh, but this thing, what it's done is it's actually glued a bunch of dead, um, a bunch of dead aphids to its back and scale and sections and stuff like that to kind of hide. So it can be a wolf in sheep's clothing, and then it just cruises around in the colonies and just picks off aphids like popcorn. Um, this is what the eggs look like over here. So these can be really mean. Another group in this that are really mean are the um, ant lions, uh, aptly named because they are great predators of ants. Most things don't mess with ants. Almost nothing will try and eat an ant, but ant lions love to eat ants. The adults are harmless and they're really cool looking. The larvae are actually harmless for us. Um, but these ant lions, they get in these uh, little funnel nests that they build, and they live down at the very bottom of that. You can watch this video, but when an ant 
walks by and it falls down in there, then that thing will actually use its pinchers at first to kind of flick sand up on the thing to kind of make it fall down further and further. And once it gets down in the death zone, it'll just jump out, grab the thing, and pull it under and eat it. I mean, it's kind of a, it's kind of really cool. It's kind of like the Sarlacc pit, now that I think about it, um, from Star Wars. Really, really cool stuff. And then another one is the Mantis pit. Uh, they call it the platypus of the insect world because it's just a combination of weird things. It looks like a mantid from here on up. The whole front of it looks like a praying mantis, right? The head looks just like it. The forelegs that are raptorial look just like it. But yet, then it looks like a neuropter in the back, and that's because um, of cool convergent evolution, right? Living, being like a mantid is really, really helpful for catching insects, and that's what this thing does. It's a, it's a predator as well. And it's very cool to go after all these insects, but it's actually a neuropteran, not a praying mantis. And I have actually had a video, um, I showed one of my classes, a 110 class, where they're talking about mantids, and they actually showed a mantispid in the middle of all their pictures of mantids. It was pretty funny. And it's from like Cornell Entomology Labs. It was pretty sad. All right, this is the snake flies, a raphidioptera. The raphidi means needle. And then optera, of course, means wing, because a needle refers to the ovipositor. But we also call these the snake flies. You should probably call it like the snake optera or something like that. I don't know. They have this elong elongated pronotum and a head that looks like a snake, and that's for hunting as well. Um, they're very, very old, this group. They've been around forever, like lived with the dinosaurs. Even though there's only 250 species alive now, we have fossils of these things that are super, super old. And they're really cool. Um, all right. So, the beetles. Okay, so the beetles are the largest group that we know of right now. They're very, very cool. Uh, there's 350,000 described species. There's probably way more than that living on the planet. About 40% of all described insects are beetles. And they eat everything. you got herbivores, uh, predators, um, some parasites, scavengers. People love like these uh, ladybird beetle larvae. They love to eat aphids. They're, so people love to have them in their garden. Those chrysopids, those little green lace wings, also really good for garden because they eat aphids. Um, so there's there's pretty much everything you can think of. They get their name because of the elytra, the hardened shell on the front of their um, on the front of their abdomen or covering their abdomen so here is a really cool beetle uh, you can see the hardened shell uh, right here it covers wings all right so we look at it like this the shell the elytra covers the the wings so they can fly and they're very very cool they just have this really uh, hard shell that covers that and it's led to some amazing adaptations for these critters uh, to allow them to be just about anywhere, live just about everywhere, uh, and and be extremely successful. Um, so that's what their wing adaptation. There, the forewing is elytra. The hind wing is the is a regular flying wing. So the elytra comes out of the metathorax, right? Um, yeah, it, the elytra is the forewing comes out of the metathorax. All right, so that's where, just to kind of get that clarified. Heads, some of these heads have crazy adaptations as well, like the snout beetle has this amazing snout coming out of his head to uh, get into um, nuts and things like that. The giraffe beetle, this is just bizarre. Who knows what that's even for? It's just really, really weird. Uh, this little thing has a... a also a head for kind of getting into seeds and things like that. This one looks like head projections. The only thing that's actually head projections is this front horn here. Uh, the rest of this is actually the pronotum. In fact, let me just grab that. Let's grab this beetle instead. Um, as you look at it, put this behind it. Uh, so this one, the front horn, it's so cool. Uh, it's the one that looks like, gosh, if I can get this right. 
the kind of like deer horns that go up. That's a projection off the head. The top horn is actually a projection off the pronotum. So they have some crazy pronotal adaptations. And then um, only the only thing that's actually the head is that tiny little bit down at the bottom with the big horn coming off, kind of like a rhinoceros nose. All right, those are very cool. You know what, I've got this, oh, never mind, I'll, I'll post them out later. There's a huge amount of variation in the antennae. Uh, some very, very cool ones like this. I'm gonna show this beetle again in a second, but uh, you can see here this beetle here on this side over here uh, has these crazy uh, serrated antennae that um, for picking up scents from probably very far away. Uh, that's definitely going to be a male. It's going to be going out and seeking out for females. It's a lot like this one at the top. I mean, this is crazy cool. Uh, some of them have very, very long antennae. Uh, I'll show one in a second like that when I can make the screen a little bigger. This one's really cool. This one has, it looks like four eyes. Um, two lower eyes. You can't see the other side of this thing, but two lower eyes and two top eyes. Turns out, this image is a little bit messed up. Uh, they shouldn't say it like this, but this is the, the image I could find of it. The top eye and the bottom eye are actually connected through the body. So it's only got the two major eyes, but it's divided so it can see fish below and it can see predators above that might be attacking it. So it's got um, two ways of trying to, to see that thing and, and stop it from getting eaten, which is very cool. A lot of them are predators, very, very cool predators, like these tiger beetles. See these massive mandibles out front. They're not huge beetles. They're, they're pretty small beetles. They're very, very fast. Uh, they, can, they, they fly up and pounce on things, and these cool coloration patterns they have on their back is how they get their name, tiger beetles. Um, and rogue beetles uh, are very, very cool little beetles. They'll eat just about anything um, that they can get their scavengers or little predators or little bugs and stuff like that. The herbivores, there's two major groups of herbivores. They're the leaf beetles and the seed beetles or the snout beetles. The snout beetles are like this one and this one. Um, they're the Kirkleonidae. They're the, by far the biggest order or the biggest family in the beetles. Uh, when I was an undergraduate at Brigham Young University, one of my projects was counting the insects in their collection, and I have the uh, badge for having counted over 100,000 snout beetles. And that's not a lie. Uh, they had quite a few. There was a guy who studied snout beetles there, so he had spent a lot of time uh, collecting, preserving, and pinning snout beetles. Uh, but there's a lot of them. There's a whole bunch. Leaf beetles, there's also a whole bunch. There's a lot more diversity and cool stuff in the leaf beetles. Um, like the Colorado potato beetle here. This is the milkweed beetle, which we'll, we'll talk about. We talk about uh, insect interactions. Um, there's just a lot of really, really cool beetles out there. Uh, these are not so cool. These are the bark beetles. are really closely related to the snout beetles, and they can wipe out whole forests. They just get in there. They chew through. You see, here's a couple little ones here. They make these incredibly cool galleries. I've got a really cool stick. I could show you uh, sometime if you come by my office. It's very beautiful, but they just wipe out whole forests, and that's not beautiful. That's kind of terrible. All right, dung beetles. Dung beetles are awesome. It's kind of gross. They eat dung, but they are they recycle huge amounts of dung, which is really really important, especially from uh, large ungulates like uh, elephants, giraffes. Uh, all, all the things out on the uh, savannah in Africa, cows, horses, almost anything you can find, you'll find some dung beetles. Um, I was pretty proud of myself when I was in high school. I was just getting into entomology. I was at somebody's farm and I saw some uh, dung, some horse dung there and it had some larvae in it. So I, I didn't handle it, but I got some and I kind of scooped it into a jar and put a lid on it and just let them live. And then a few months later, all of a sudden, I saw a couple of adult beetles walking around in there. Uh, they're still in my collection to this day. I don't have them in here. I should have brought them in. Um, but they're extremely beneficial to us. So we would be 
up to our eyeballs in dung if it hadn't been for these ingenious, awesome little beetles. I found a really cool one in Africa, but the cool one, I was on a preserve and I couldn't keep it. Um, but I got another one uh, there. I'm going to show it now. So let's go right here. This top one here, uh, I collected in Thailand in some elephant dung. Um, we were driving along in the rainforest and I saw a big thing of elephant dung sitting there and so I jumped out and started going through it and bam there it was I got a few out of there really really cool also got this little one over here from that same pile um, this one right here I just collected in Botswana um, actually in the town of Haberoni just outside of town when I was there a few months ago um, we, I found a really big one like this, but it was, like I said, it was on a nature preserve. It was on some um, really fresh water buffalo dung, and they, you know, I didn't want to. I was on a nature preserve, so I couldn't take it. I was trying to be ethical and like, hey, this is not cool. I shouldn't do that. Um, there's uh, as we go through these different lifestyles, uh, some of them are even parasites. These are the the possus. Uh, beetles they're parasites of ants um, they get in there and they uh, infiltrate the nest they feed on the larvae um, which is pretty cool they convince the ants that they are um, they're just like them they hang out all right uh, these are the zoferid beetles ironclad beetles they're very cool they're kind of incredible I've only collected one in my life and at the time I was in high school I didn't know what it was but I remember I could not get a needle a pin through it it was so hard to get a pin through it uh, turns out they can withstand a huge amount of pressure like 39,000 times its own weight I drive over these with a Toyota Camry and the thing still uh, survives which is in completely insane right they can withstand animal stumps bird pecks uh, they're just crazy cool um, and there's a whole bunch of ironclad beetles. This is just one of them. There's lots of others. Uh, modes of defense. These are the click beetles. These are really cool. They they make this great clicking sound. They can pop up in the air. They can click to annoy things. Um, these that I showed a second ago, these are actually a couple of click beetles that we've got going here. Uh, the one on this side right here is what I just collected in... Um, Botswana when I was there a few months ago uh, in a little town really really cool it's the coolest click bill I've ever collected this I mean before that this is the best one I ever had I got it down in Texas and I thought that was massive for a click beetle I thought they were super super cool so uh, the other one in Botswana I was pretty excited about I'm not gonna lie it was pretty fun um, I should have shown those right here you know, I'll pull them back up because I'll make them big on this page. <laughs> All right, so there's our two little click beetle buddies. Take a look at that. All right, a lot of these beetles have some really cool modes of defense. They have some really cool um, growths. Like I mentioned before, I was showing that little beetle. This Hercules beetle, this right here is head, and all this, these two horns and this big horn up front, that's actually all um, pronotum. But these you can do a, a pretty good pinch. These, this stag beetle could have a pretty good pinch as well. Um, very, very cool. Most of this, this stag beetle is for fighting, uh, fighting with males to get the affection of a female, but there are some really cool um, beetles that do this stuff like that. I'm going to show you some. Uh, from my collection here, some of my favorite beetles we got here, um, right here. This is actually a, um, a kind of a rhinoceros beetle, like the one we were just looking at, the Hercules beetle, a lot smaller. This one is one that kids in Thailand love to have as pets. They're really cool. Right above it is a, um, is a metallic wood boring beetle. They actually turn those things into jewelry. They're very, very cool in that regard. In the middle, uh, right over here, this is a, a really impressive longhorn beetle. Longhorn beetle because of those long antennae that it has. I collected that in Puerto Rico. 
uh, years ago at a research station. It flew in at night. I was pretty excited about that. Um, next to that over here is a kind of a jeweled scarab. Very cool beetle. And then at the end here is a stag beetle. Kind of like the one we were just looking at with those massive, impressive mandibles. And then I got to show you one other one. This is Wallace's longhorn beetle. This I did not collect. This was given to me as a gift from one of my former students. But look at the size of that thing. I mean, it's just a massive beetle with incredibly long antennae. Um, one of the coolest beetles I've ever seen. Sorry, the reflection's not so good. Um, but Wallace's longhorn beetle the, from Indonesia. Very, very cool stuff. All right, there's a lot of cool camouflage that goes on with these things. This thing down here is one of my favorites. It's called the mouse turd beetle. And it's named because of it looks like a piece of mouse turd when it's uh, when you find it. It's very, very small. And I mean, if you're going to look like something that you don't want to get eaten, look like feces. No one's going to touch a mouse turd and say, hey, this looks like good food. And this is a longhorn beetle here that's camouflaged incredibly well. Here's a um, death feigning beetle. Really cool. You pick it up and it just pretends like it's dead. Because most birds are going to be like, oh, I don't want a dead beetle. That's nasty. I'm not going to eat that. It could be all rotted out. Um, aposematic coloration is very popular amongst beetles that are uh, poisonous. Right? You signal to the predator like, hey, I'm bad news. I'm poisonous. Don't eat me. I'm going to make you sick. It'd be really gross. Uh, there's more aposematic coloration on these blister beetles. They, uh, they aren't gross to taste so much as they eject um, cantharin out of their knee joints when they get uh, when someone messes with them. That's why they're called blister beetles. Um, they can cause blisters on human skin. Um, not very tasty because nobody wants that in their mouth. Um, these are really cool. These are the bombardier beetles. These actually spray kind of an acidic, hot, noxious chemical spray at you. Um, it mixes two compounds. So uh, Kind of like spiders. Spiders mix multiple compounds to make a web because you can't just be full of webbing all the time. Uh, these mix hydroquinone and hydrogen peroxide in two separate reservoirs and then shoots that, uh, that solution out. Um, it causes a really quick reaction uh, and brings a mixture nearly to the boiling point. It produces gas that drives the ejection. So it's uh, pretty incredible. Here's a little video of that uh, to look at. Our last order for this section is just the uh, the uh, twisted wing parasites, the Strepsiptera. Very very cool critters. Uh, they are parasitic on leafhoppers, grasshoppers, and others. You can see here. Um, this is what the parasite looks like. This is the abdomen of a wasp, and they're in between these sections of the abdomen. Um, and then the adults have these crazy antennae. Uh, they have these weird little wings, only two pairs of wings, um, and then halteers in place of the four wings. Uh, these are the hind wings. Uh, very, very cool things. So that takes us through the first group. The next uh, lecture will be on the second group of uh, whole metabolus insects. Thanks for watching.